Hello Gems! Welcome to another episode of Tiaras in Tech. I'm your host, Shelley Benhoff, and today I'm talking to Carrie Harbath, and she's a project coordinator at Pluralsight. We talked about her experience as the mother of a child with health conditions, how ableism affects mental health, and how to support people with health conditions in the workplace and also in life. Without further ado, on to the episode. Hey, Carrie, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Hey, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is such a pleasure. And after working together for so long, yeah. and now we're here. This is amazing. Exactly. Yeah. I just want to mention to the audience that Carrie was my first editor at Pluralsight in like 2016 or something. Wow. So we have known wow. each other for a while. Yeah. yeah, that has been, I mean, how many years is that? I don't six. even know. Oh, yeah. that's About wild. Six years. Yeah. I know, and that's right? amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. And now the tables have turned. You're going to be editing my stuff. That's so here right. we are. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Here we are. <laughs> Fun <Yeah>. for you. <laughs> so yeah, let's just jump right in and have you tell us how you got started in tech. Yeah. So um, it was kind of unexpected. I... Uh, uh, when my husband and I first got married, we moved down um, to what's now known as Silicon Slopes. We moved down to that area here in Utah. Um, I don't think at the time we hadn't really hit peak Silicon Slope status yet. So it was kind of up and coming. Um, but I moved down to the area where like Ancestry.com and a lot of up and coming apps were located um, and websites and sort of like a tech hub. And um, while I was going to school, I got an internship at a company called Family Link. And they actually had, if you or anybody remembers, they had the, uh, for a while, this is way back at the beginning of like Facebook time, early Facebook time, um, there was, you could have widgets on your Facebook profile. And this uh, Family Link had a My Family widget. It was a stick figure widget that went viral at the time. And um, I worked on customer support for this viral widget. <laughs> and it kind of, just by default of interning at this company, I grew into, um, from interning in customer support, I moved into product, marketing, and it was a very small startup group. Um, we traveled across the United States. We did some contextual inquiry research around how families communicate through social media and technology, which was really fascinating and a really cool opportunity for me um, at such a young age and such a sort of young place in school and my education. Um, and then through that, the startup was actually acquired by Ancestry.com. I worked at Ancestry for a little while, and then my husband and I made another move. Um, and then over the last, I guess that would be what, about 10 years, I've worked at various companies from, you know, sales companies that are heavily involved in the tech world, um, all the way to Pluralsight. And uh, eventually I landed the job at Pluralsight. Um, and I, before then I worked in like a lot of data roles, marketing roles, um, and that's really where my expertise kind of lands. Um, and then eventually ended up at Pluralsight. I started as an editor. So shout out to the editor days, um, worked in that role for a couple years. And then I actually moved to marketing at Pluralsight, which was a really rewarding, exciting job at the time. Um, you know, Pluralsight was, uh, really taking off as well. And, um, I had some really amazing opportunities through that job. Uh, it was just really exciting and I really enjoyed that and then came back, um, to content because I just love, honestly, I love working with authors like you. Um, and it's just such a rewarding job to be a part of our content realm at Pluralsight. And so I ended up coming back and I work in the data, uh, domain now at Pluralsight. Um, but yeah, I, it all started with that internship and customer support and then just grew thanks to many mentors along the way, wonderful people who, um, you know, saw, uh, saw things in me that I probably didn't even see at the time. And so I'm so grateful for those opportunities. And, and now here I am. So yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And yeah. furthermore, you have a course of your own on yeah. uh, ableism, which is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And you're also in my course that should come out um, 
relatively around the time this episode comes out. Uh, so yeah, my course is um, on e eliminating uh, bias, prejudices, and stereotypes through increased understanding of others. They really like to give me the long titles. Yeah, that was a good title. <laughs> my course is. <laughs> yeah. <Whew>. So <laughs> I... Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about why is it important um, to you to spread awareness and support um, towards people who are um, affected, you know, by ableism? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you know, uh, this is something that has been a more recent experience for me in the last three years. So my daughter um, was born with a syndrome called charge syndrome and she's profoundly deaf blind. That's her long lifelong uh, diagnosis. Beyond that, she has a long list of medical complexities um, and we are involved in the medical world, like our local um, level four state Children's Hospital is our home away from home. We roll in there. Everybody knows us. They know her. We know them. It's like our our um, family. And so in many ways, um, she's exposed me to a world that I never knew before, which is the world of disabilities. And um, because of that, you know, I have had a lot. I've had a lot to learn. I started out when she was first born with my, I think, really well-intentioned mom heart. Um, sharing our experience and our journey online. And the way that started was by sharing a lot about Sloan, my daughter. And um, I was just sort of doing the best that I could, right? Scrambling in my own, because as parents, we experience our own, um, we're navigating a world we didn't expect. You know, there's a lot, the medical complexities add on to that. Uh, so we weren't sure if she was gonna make it those first few months. Like there was just a lot that we were navigating with Sloan. And so I was um, sharing her experience online, her journey, and a lot of things that now I look back and I'm like, I wish I wouldn't have shared some of these things that I shared at the time. Um, because of what I've learned from some of the adults that I follow now who are living um, with disabilities or with health conditions or with their own experience. And I have really stepped back and tried to listen and learn from them. And so because of Sloan, it's exposed me to this community of people uh, that I feel so connected to now through Sloan. So, you know, I'm the first to say that I myself don't have a disability yet like asterisk because uh disability i mean we're all likely to be affected by disability in our lifetime and that's you know just a fact i think that most people don't acknowledge um but with that said i while i don't have one yet it is something that is near and dear to my heart and being so close to plural sight having worked there having worked with authors this felt like such a great opportunity to offer this knowledge that i have what i've learned from my you know friends who have disabilities who have medical complexities and try to take some of that emotional labor that emotional burden off of them in the workplace by doing my part in a way that i could um yeah. and so that's really what motivated me to make the course and then since then it's been you know really rewarding to see um some of the people that have taken the course, the feedback I've received. And then just in general, again, like, I think my biggest goal ultimately is to alleviate that emotional labor as much as possible, because that's what I hear as a non-disabled person from many of my friends is that, you know, that's, that falls to them and it's unfair uh, how often it falls onto them to have to navigate, you know, the world of disabilities in the workplace. So. Exactly. Yeah. I um, have told you that, your course was the first one, the first time in my life I had heard the term invisible disability. And like, I have one, I stutter, I went to speech uh, therapy um, from when I was in kindergarten until I was like 20. Um, I am still in touch with my childhood speech therapist. Oh, I love that. I she love that. She's known me since I was like, I don't know, seven or eight. Oh my I'm 42. God. No, that's so. amazing. That is amazing, Shelly. Yeah, I, totally. Yeah, 
Yeah, because Sloan has, I mean, Sloan has a speech, occupational, physical. She has all of her therapists too. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Love that. Yeah. People who like really care, who um, will support not only the ailment itself or just the health condition. It, it isn't an illness or whatever. It's just a condition, yeah. but also support the mental health implications that we, you know, inherently have because um, people who have conditions are generally um, seen as weaker or um, sometimes like people will try to tell us that we can get better if we try harder. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I, or yes. People um, prescribe to me all of the time how I can stop stuttering, you know, oh, just for as an adult too. Just don't You're be like, nervous. okay. Yeah. Oh, it oh. still happens to me all of the time. I I don't like to call places. I have a story about speech therapy. Actually, this is the funniest thing that ever happened. Um, I so much don't like to call places. They used to force me to. Um, they used to make me call restaurants and stuff and, and ask for directions because I'm old and we didn't used to have like MapQuest or anything <laughs> like that. Um <laughs> And so I, I asked and the person told me the directions. I was, I was about to say thank you and hang up. And they asked me to repeat the directions back oh. and I hung up. <laughs> I, <love it. laughs> I was like, I was in elementary school for sure. Oh. But that is like, yeah. wow. I wish you had this on video somehow because that is so. <laughs> I know. Somewhere... But also great solution. Smart. <laughs> like way to go. <laughs> yeah. And I, I believe it would pain them to know that that exercise actually made me talk. Like I still don't talk on the phone. Really? Yeah. I can talk like to a person I can see like that's still, but I don't like to talk on the phone. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's because um, if I stutter, the people can't see my tics and stuff like that, which is yeah. actually a bad thing because if you can see it, you can tell that I'm still talking and I'm trying to work through a block or whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because anecdotally, one thing that I've uh, been navigating with Sloan is that she we've walked the line of trying not to over therapize basically like so many therapies that she disengages or doesn't want to do something. And so you talk about how that impacted you long-term, you know, like um, Sloan had her own way of hanging up when it came to physical therapy. She would know when the physical therapist came into the house and she would fall asleep. Yeah. And then, and she, and, and either it was legit or you could tell she was faking it because her eyes would squint tighter yeah. <laughs> and she's like, no, I'm asleep. Don't mess with me. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So it's, I think it's just, yeah. Anyway, that just anecdotal, but I think that's so important is, to be aware of is just that, uh, those experiences can impact someone oh, lifelong, yeah. you know? Yeah. It, yeah. And unfortunately for me, my whole childhood, I was told that I would grow out of it because most people uh, do, right? Some of us don't. And yeah. stuttering only impacts 1% of the world's population. So there's not a lot of research going on or whatever. Yeah, wow. Um, that's all I know about my condition is that it's um, genetic. Other than that, I don't, and there's no rhyme or reason to when it happens. I could be nervous. I could be happy. I could be sad whenever, like it just happens. And wow. like, yeah, people um, are made very uncomfortable by it. And that um, uncomfortable feeling leads them to just hate me. <laughs> you know, I'm making them uncomfortable. How dare I be in their space making them yeah. uncomfortable? Yeah. So. It's, it's so hard. I think too, like we, uh, when it comes to like health conditions or disabilities, our whole life, many of us are taught not things like not to stare, right. Not yeah. to engage. And 
there's an element of that, of course. You don't want to stare in a bad way. Like, you don't want to be, like, staring yeah. and throwing shade or looks. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it also has taught many of us that, you know, like, we yeah, to, to avoid altogether, right. to disengage, to, um, I mean, it's just, I think that's a great example of how people should lean in and yes. lean like lean in, in with you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. Cause like I'm, I'm uncomfortable for you. Even yeah. if the person hates me, I empathize with that feeling. I know if I'm blocking and um, my, my facial tics are happening, that looks weird. <laughs> you know, I yeah. know that, but just understand that that's just a part of who I am. I've, yeah. I've started to tell people I stutter. This is just how I talk. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. that's wonderful. It's also, it's wonderful and simultaneously sucks that you have to make that disclaimer because yeah. people can't like to the point of just leaning in, can't just lean in yeah. with you, you know? Oh yeah. Like to the point where if, um, if a person, you know, has a in, visible uh disability sorry i'm like trying to get my <laughs> cadence back oh geez yeah. <laughs> um people mock them openly um that is i think the worst for people who stutter because that's normalized um anybody listening to this if you ever hear the phrase did i stutter please shut that down I yeah. want, we all want that phrase to be out of movies, to yes. be out of, you know, television shows and all of that. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. know where I was going with that. I'm no. sorry. Why, well, if I but, can add on to that maybe a little bit, absolutely. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. A thousand percent. I think this probably goes on to, I know you had the question around language in mm -hmm. our list of questions as well. And that is a great example of language that we need to right be aware of in the workplace and, avoid. and mm -hmm. avoid, I mean, just in life, I, you know, this, like, obviously ableism in the workplace was my course <laughs> because it applies to the work we do, but generally mm -hmm. we just need to avoid this stuff. And, yeah. um, a great example, when I think of Sloan, my daughter is that I hear all the time and see all the time people using terms like, Oh, uh, I'm not, or am I blind? Am I blind? I mean, mm -hmm. and that for me, even as her parent, right, immediately sends me to like, no, but my daughter legitimately is. And yeah. it's really hard to hear that. <laughs> or, yeah. yeah, like, or when people are like, oh, you know, I, I'm deaf. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. And again, it's like, well, my daughter legitimately is. And you mm -hmm. just said that. And yeah. of course, you learn, which is the unfortunate part. You learn how to navigate this in a way that people never catch on, right? And so that's why either this course becomes so important because you can't always exhibit that. Like you're not always in the mood to face the emotional labor piece of it all head on. Right. Like it's exhausting if you're doing that 24 seven. And so that's where the course or these conversations come into play because this is the meaningful work that needs to be done. Exactly. Um, and then to the point of invisible disabilities, my husband died by suicide. And so today, right, when I hear people say, oh, I just want to kill myself. Like that, for me, that's a pretty rough one to hear. I mean, it almost yeah. makes me tear up just talking about it now. I'm so when sorry. people, yeah, it's because it's so, it's rough, right? And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, and then you add on the layer of like the trauma that I've experienced around that. I mean, he was a wonderful human. And so there's so many layers on top of that, that people don't think about, you know, I have um, a friend who's, who had a family member die by suicide um, and he had completed suicide with a gun. And so, so often when we're in meetings or things like that, we will do the motion, right? Like you'll see people do the motion of shooting themselves is like, Oh, I want to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Another great example of like, you know, ableism moves far, far beyond what we like. It's my daughter is has some pretty profound disabilities that she'll live with her entire life that may, you know, make her dependent on me for the rest of her life. Um, and that's very easy to see, but it's the invisible part and it's the language piece and the things that we face in our day to day that people don't realize how important that is and how crucial that is and how heavily that sits with people like you and me until you have experienced it yourself. And right. 
Yeah. So I think that's such an important thing to talk about. So going back to it, it's like, okay. did I stutter? Cut it out. You know, yeah. blind, deaf. Um, oh, I want to kill myself. Like all of these things stem from an ableist culture because yeah. truly they go back to some form of disability, whether it's invisible, visible or not. Absolutely. And I've also heard um, stuff like, you know, my emotions are all over the place. I'm, oh. I'm so by polar today. Yep. I'm like, that's not something that you can just be. That's a no. condition. One that I have one that sucks. You know? Yes. Yes. Um, and to hear that, you know, is just like, if you're not diagnosed with it, you don't have it, you know, yeah. and if you think you have it, go get a diagnosis. Yeah, no, you exactly. Know? Please, yeah. please. Yeah. That is one of the most classic symptoms that I've had that other people have when you're bipolar and you're riding that high wave, you're manic and you're like charisma, you know, you're just like can talk to anybody, um, just it's, it's all um, easier, right? And you're like achieving stuff at a really high level. Um, yeah. At that point, we tend to think we're not bipolar. We don't need meds. I thought that for 17 years. And then I finally wow. realized I have been suffering yeah. and I need my mood stabilized and I need some, you know, concrete um, coping mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, so. I mean, it's so important. I, I, um, even through the loss and the experiences that I've had over the last few years, I have my own medication that I take. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's another great example of, of language when people yeah. are like, Oh, I'm off my meds today. Jokingly that, another right. one. Right. <laughs> like, because Absolutely. here, here we are and we're people that actually legitimately have medication that we take. Yeah. <laughs> and so then you hear people say that and you're like, okay, well, it's not so funny when it's, your reality. And so I think right. like, it's, yeah, it's just a great example of how we've become so flippant in the language we use, the things we say, I think just, you know, a big piece of it is having empathy and really looking at the people you're around for who they are and what their life experience is mm -hmm. and understanding like, you may think something's funny and may land in a funny way, but it's for others, it can it can hit deeply. And it's, I mean, you shouldn't have to experience that, you know, yeah. like, we shouldn't have to experience that. And so and we shouldn't have to go to therapy for it. <laughs> no, exactly. Like, we shouldn't have to end the work day and then end up in therapy talking about what someone said in a meeting. Like, that's yeah. just not, you know, yeah. that's not how it should be. So Absolutely yeah, not. yeah, yeah. Let's take a short break from trauma porn okay? and <laughs> talk about, um, I, my yeah. life, our life. <laughs> that is our life. I yes, have, exactly. I have a, um, segment for the show that I like to call precious gems. This is where I take a, um, comment from social media and, um, yeah, from, you know, Instagram, Ooh, Sorry, I hit my mic from Instagram, TikTok, uh, Pinterest now. I actually have followers on there. So, wow, that's yeah. amazing. Absolutely. Wow, I need to check that out. Um, yeah, so this uh, comment comes from hercode.org um, saying it is good advice uh, to usually ask the audience before you start a presentation um, to understand who they are. And they say, actually, this was also excellent um, advice. I like to engage my audience before I start asking them questions and before I also, you know, <laughs> um, mix them in. Um, and sometimes I feed off their answers and go off script. It gets them to stay engaged. I agree. Well, I love that. Absolutely. Thank you, Hercode Org, for the comment. All right. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. Stop sharing. Let's go back to talking about ableism. Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, accessibility because as a person who, you know, like I can walk, I can see most of the time, but there are a lot of people 
in um, the community who really have needs that need to be addressed in the workplace, like, yeah. like physical needs. How can we ensure that workplaces are accessible for people? Yeah, that that is such a tough one because I think that often, well, first off, remote work uh, has helped tremendously. Um, so remote work, I mean, that right there solves a lot for a lot of people. Um, and I think that's amazing. Asynchronous work in addition to that helps a lot. You know, I think about even me navigating life with Sloan, we have, uh, right now it's died down a little bit, but we usually have, I mean, five medical appointments a week around there. And then you tack on therapies and then you tack on, um, you know, all the other things that we navigate together, um, the asynchronous piece of it too can be so helpful because it allows us to get for her to get the medical care she needs. I can be there for that um, and help her get that and then can also get my job done. So I think asynchronous asynchronous work is another like key aspect of it all too, because there are a lot of people who face health conditions um, and medical needs that need that um, you know, flexibility to be able to go to their medical appointments, to see their therapists, to, you know, there, there's just so much that goes with the world of not just disabilities, but also medical complexities. Um, and some often those medical complexities can also be invisible. You know, we, we don't see them, uh, at face value when we meet someone. And so I think that, uh, both remote and asynchronous work have helped tremendously with that. But when it comes to like, even with remote work, for example, you know, always having captions turned on um, for, you know, listeners, viewers, um, text to speech um, platforms, you know, making sure you always have text to speech accessibility ready. Um, I was just talking to somebody the other day about how for neuro neurodivergent folks, um, you know, timed testing can be pretty intense. And so, ensuring that you have a way to navigate times testing for your neurodivergent employees or whoever may be experiencing like, you know, needing to take a timed test of sorts, that kind of stuff, um, having the flexibility around that and the, you know, equipment and um, tools set up for that kind of accessibility is also so important. And then like in the office, you know, when you have in-office employees, making sure if you have a wheelchair user that they, you know, have Easy, like can easily access the office um, from whether it's getting to their desk, is their desk high enough, are the things that we don't think about, right? Like, is there enough space for them to navigate around the office? Um, that is something I face, Sloan currently uses a wheelchair and I face that with her all the time. We'll get places and hallways will be just narrow enough that we can't quite get through them. Um, or, you know, desks, tables, are they at the right height for someone? Mm -hmm. um, if someone has a visual impairment, but you're in a meeting, can you give them a large print version of the slides, you know, so they can see them at their own pace visually, you know, instead of them having to try to read what's on a presentation across the room, things like that. Just keeping in mind truly who your employees are, understanding mm -hmm. what their needs are. Um, and then it's, I mean, again, it's the concept of like leaning in with them, understanding what they need, and then providing that without them having to constantly ask for it, constantly follow up. Um, you know, and a great way to do that is when you hire someone, I mean, you know, there are uh, rules that go along with this, but if you know someone faces some kind of medical condition or um, disability, just straight up asking, like, how can we best accommodate you? And creating a list or a set of, you know, needs at first, and then always making sure you as a leader or as a team member follow that and yeah. that you're never continuing to put that emotional labor, again, that term, but back on that person for them to continue to remind you what they need, because that's where it gets exactly. exhausting. And, you know, the workplace becomes uh, a lot less inclusive. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I have two stories to share about that, um, that I have experienced and observed. I, um, had a manager who um, lost his leg at some point and he um, had a uh, prosthetic, right? There was no elevator in that building. And oh, furthermore, man. the steps 
okay, I'm a very short person. And those each, it, it, it had those tall steps. Tall steps come up to like my calf. Okay. <laughs> like they're not yeah. easy for me. Yeah. And I couldn't even imagine him trying to haul up those stairs every single day. Like that must have been horrible. Even yeah. for me, it was hard because I have um, asthma too. And while I can like walk straight, you know, and I don't have a problem. Stairs, man. I cannot do stairs. I actually traveled to that office and I had to leave early and refuse to come back because I couldn't, I couldn't get up the stairs. Like, (laughs) wow, that is so intense. And again, talk about then. I mean, that's a great example though. Like what, yeah, if, if here you are and talk about from a leader's perspective, efficiency or needing you there to, you know, like collaborate on something or, you know, like that is affecting your, the morale for you so intensely of this, yeah. you know, company. And then on top of that, like, um, you're not going back. <laughs> like, it's no. just like work was cut off for the day. Like that. Never. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I had a panic attack for 45 minutes in their bathroom. They only had two bathrooms for like 50 people. So like, I I know that I was taking up that space for way too long and people needed to use the bathroom, but I needed somewhere to go. I didn't have anywhere else to go. There were no offices open ever. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. I mean, those are great examples. The panic attack too is a great example. That's the invisible yeah. piece of it, right? Where exactly. like, and that's like the testing piece. I mean, I think people take that. I've, I've seen people kind of flippantly disregard that um, too. And that's, it's like, you, you don't know what it's like until you experience that. And yeah. you, I don't, you don't know how else to describe it to someone. Same with the panic attack. It's like, yeah. you don't know what that's like until you've experienced it and you mm-hmm. need that safe space to go and there should be better options for you there. You know, like, totally. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I teach people all of the time to, you know, I also have a course on this, increasing mental health awareness for improved yeah. inclusiveness. Which so is segue, a great course, by the way. Shout segue out. Segue into our... Um, mental health portion of this yeah. conversation um with ableism I, it just uh, it kills your confidence when you have people who are constantly telling you how you should be telling you that you're not normal telling you that there is something wrong with you that needs to be fixed mm-hmm. and i can tell you that yesterday my therapist said something to me that I just start, I collapsed and started to ball. She said, so crap. What was it? You, you're fine, right? You are um, normal. Like everyone has problems. No one is normal. I wish I could remember the exact words that she said to me. God darn it. <laughs> it's like I I'm love that, blocking them out. But in that moment, like I needed to hear that because my entire life, I have not been told that the, yeah. the messaging applied to me has always been, um, since I, you know, I'm pretty fluent. Um, I have a very like, moderate um stutter so i can hide it most of the time and people will you know tell me how i can fix it they'll tell me that you know i just have to talk slower i just have to not be nervous you know <laughs> like sure <sighs> turn it off do you want yeah, no exactly <laughs> book yeah. of mormon turn it yeah, off exactly. right no <laughs> no <laughs> That doesn't, doesn't work. work. That no, <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Great yeah. reference. That was good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's Ooh. one of my favorite songs ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, mine too. One of my favorite musicals ever. It's, oh it's, God, it's absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's so good. It's such so a good, good one. Yeah, yeah. But like, mental health support. Um, back to that. Um, 
my point in all of that was people need to have a quiet room in the workplace for people to, you know, pray or um, yep. have a panic attack or just have a quiet moment yep. by themselves, especially if you have an open floor plan. Oh my you gosh, know? yes. I yes. have literally been sitting at my desk having a panic attack and crying and people are just like, what? what is going yeah. on? This is weird. I didn't have anywhere to go, you know? Yeah. So no, you're spot on. I mean, and that goes, uh, and, and if we're going, if a company is truly going to live up to, you know, diversity and inclusion efforts and truly without it being a form of lip service or performative in any sense, that is an essential thing that needs to be done, um, mm -hmm. on all fronts, whether like you mentioned prayer, um, all the way to sensory needs. You know, I think of uh, the world that I'm in with Sloan and there are so many, you know, right now I'm surrounded by, I, I have a lot of adults that I've connected with through like Sloan's experience that have become my friends on social media who have their own sensory needs or their own, they have disabilities, medical conditions, whatever. Um, but that I face a lot of children that are in real life that I know that we've had to navigate places where they need safe spaces so that they can step back and be in quiet for a moment and have their sensory needs taken care of and, yep. and just breathe. And um, yeah, because it can be, I mean, it can all be so overwhelming. And then the open floor plan. I mean, it's. No, thank you. No, I agree. I'm like, Oh, yeah. it's, it can be so distracting. It's, there's so many elements to it. And so there have to be safe spaces, both mentally, physically, I mean, there have to be safe spaces for people to go. Like, that's just yeah. the reality of it. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you are just, you don't like being in an office. Well, actually, for most of us, we're, we're not in an office anymore. I yeah. personally haven't worked full time in an office for like 12 years, you know? That's amazing. <clears throat> yeah. 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 I, and I think I've been out for almost since Sloan was born, actually, they were okay. great and sent me remote earlier than most. That's nice. sites. So at uh, yeah. three years, I've been totally remote now, but. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. And especially, oh my gosh, for you with all, like appointments and yeah. all of that, how do you do all of that? <sighs> That's a great question. Survival is you just try to survive. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. like a big piece of it most of the time. Um, but you know, beyond that, I mean, it's, uh, the amazing thing is, and I think like, you know, we kind of touched on this last time, but, um, one of the things that I learned early on when I was talking about Sloan's experience and I was it, my good intentioned mom heart, well-intentioned mom heart was sharing our journey. I would use terms all the time, like, um, uh, like differently abled or like fluffy terms, right. To, to kind of soften the idea of disability. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I was doing it for my own sake because I didn't understand the world of disabilities. I hadn't been exposed to much yet. Um, and then as I've learned from some of my adult friends with disabilities and, um, you know, just sort of ableist culture that because of softening the term, now it's turned into this term that we view as a negative thing. Like mm -hmm. it is, it, we view it as an issue, as a problem when in reality, it's not, it's a natural part of life. Um, and most of us in our lifetime will face a disability at some point, and that's right. just the reality of it. And, um, and there's such a thing as disability pride, you know, <laughs> like that, that exists yeah. too. And, um, and so I say all of that because in sort of, um, you know, not just accepting, but embracing Sloan's disabilities and starting to lean into that with her. There have been so many, it's not just me. Like I, for sure, I, at the end of the day, it falls on me to make sure everything gets done. And I, I take care of her and, and we navigate that together. But at the same time, there's a team of people in my case, I know not everyone is as fortunate that has been so supportive, whether it's family and friends, or it extends beyond that um, in leaning into Sloan's disabilities and using those terms. You know, I've had great access to um, schools that focus on Sloan's disability and deaf blindness and helping, educating her, supporting us therapists, you know, you mentioned speech therapy. She's had, I think, 10 ther different types of therapies. Um, we 
I have case managers that help us manage our medical appointment load and like where, who we need to see and when and why, because she has so many specialists. Um, and then just, you know, facing it all, knowing that things can change. I mean, I know it sounds a bit existential, but things can change at any time and yep. for better or for worse or in this kind of a mundane meh way. <laughs> and, um, and so I think like, you know, doing it all at the end of the day, it does land with me and I navigate that with her. But at the same time, it does require community support. Um, and then also just in the case of like my course or, you know, having, um, these types of conversations, a lot of this has stemmed from what I've learned from my peers and my friends who have disabilities and have medical complexities that have shared their experiences with me and have talked about the emotional labor piece. And I'm like, okay, well, that seems like a place where I could help or where I could, you know, uh, help in some way. And so anyway, that was kind of a round, that was a, <laughs> a tangenty answer to your question. <laughs> it's a podcast. But, okay, Tangents okay. are expected, totally. <gasps> I am the queen everybody. of tangents. So yeah, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, yeah, so what advice do you have for anyone who wants to learn more about ableism, including your course? Uh, obviously. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks. Um, well, I think the biggest thing again, that it goes back to is just, um, connect with people who have disabilities, who have medical complexities and understand their experience. Lean in. That's the biggest thing. I think mm -hmm. we, we overthink like, uh, when we think about diversity and inclusion efforts, right. We, there. I don't know how to explain this, but there comes a sense of like, we must perform and we must be the ones to share the experience. And that's not, that's not how this works. Like we need to listen when it's not our experience that we're having, we need to listen and learn and then share or advocate where appropriate, become an ally where appropriate. Um, and so I think that's the biggest first step is, you know, like who in your workplace, who in your community, um, do you know that faces a long list of appointments or has navigated something in this realm, invisible or visible disability? And how can you, you know, even just watching their experience from afar without putting the onus on them to explain anything to you, how can you learn more from them and under better understand how they navigate the world and how you can lean into that with them and others in their community? Um, so connecting with adults and really understanding their experience. The, you know, a big thing I see with Sloan is we have, I mean, which she's been a literal infant, so it makes sense, but we have the tendency to infantilize people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and Sloan is three and she is wild and she is, oh, she's my cray. See, I want, I don't even want to use that word. Nope. See, caught myself. See, I'm even guilty of it. <laughs> We all are. Absolutely. Yeah, we all are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a great example. Um, but she's my, yeah, my wild, uh, three nager is the term that my friend used the other day, even though it's a bit, we joked, it's a cringy term, but my three nager. No, I love it. Um, yeah. And we go out in public and I hear all the time term that people say things like, Oh, what a sweet angel, special child, you know, like infantilizing her experience. And she's over there ripping my hair out wanting, I mean, she'll, She'll, she's learned to roll her wheels on her wheelchair and roll away from me as fast mm -hmm. as possible. And so I have to run and catch her, things like that. And so, again, I think it's like uh, avoiding infantilizing other people with medical condition, conditions, disabilities, and leaning into their experience and understanding where they're coming from. Um, and then I actually have a book. I, I pulled it out of my bookshelf. But this is an amazing book. It's uh, Demystifying Disability by Emily Liddell. Um, and it's uh, demystifying disability, what to know, what to say, and how to be an ally. Um, and it's an amazing book. She has a presence on Instagram for sure. I don't know where else, but Instagram for sure. Um, and she's just amazing, amazing. And this book is an easy read. And I think it's a really great start from the perspective of someone who does have a disability. Um, and it's a great start in understanding how to become an ally and, um, and what 
her experience looks like. And so I would highly recommend that. There are amazing podcasts out there, you know, that talk about the experience of um, disability specifically. Um, so I, you know, learning from those and then just following. I mean, you can follow, there's like disability talk on TikTok, you know, like follow influencers, follow people who um, are have decided to openly navigate their life online living with disabilities or medical complexities or whatever it might be and you know take the time to learn from them so that you can better help your community and i think um that's a big piece of it just listening and learning at the end of the day is how we're going to make a difference yeah yeah you know this podcast could go on for hours but yeah yeah wrap it up before i let you go can you tell people where to connect with you online Yes. So, um, unfortunately my biggest presence, (laughs) which I always feel a little cringy saying this is Instagram. So Carrie and Sloan, I know, but I just, when people use the term influencer, I'm like, Oh, I want to be the counterculture. I want to be an anti-influencer anyway. So Carrie and Sloan on Instagram. Um, and then I'm just Carrie Harbath on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with people on LinkedIn. Um, and then Carrieharbath.com is my website. So that's awesome. Yeah. 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 Well, I will have links to all of your stuff in the show notes slash description. Carrie, thank you. Thank you so much. This is so meaningful. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. If you want to support us, please like, subscribe, and share this episode with your fellow gems. Let me know in the comments what other topics you would like me to cover and follow TRs in Tech on social media and use the hashtag MakeYourselfShine. Thanks for watching or listening and have a great day.